Hi everyone, my name is Yasmin and I'm the Communications Coordinator here at TechSoup Canada. I want to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar, Growth Strategies to Scale Up Your Small Nonprofit. First, we would like to acknowledge the sacred land on which TechSoup Canada office operates. It has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron, Wendat, and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy, the Confederacy of the Ojibwe, and allied nations to peaceably share and care for resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are very grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community on this territory. So before we get started, I'd like to quickly introduce you to TechSoup Canada. Our mission is to help nonprofits use technology effectively, and we accomplish this in two ways. The first is to make technology products more affordable to charities, nonprofits, and libraries across Canada through our technology donations program. So we partner with tech companies such as Microsoft, Adobe, Symantec, and offer their products at an either outright donation or at a significant discount. Membership is free, and it gets you access to donated and do discounted software from more than 30 tech companies. Through this program, we've helped over 42,000 nonprofits access more than $422 million worth of technology. The second way we try to help nonprofits use technology effectively is by creating and curating nonprofit tech resources. We write blogs, curate content on social media, and host events and webinars like this one to help nonprofits learn more about the technologies that can help them in their day to day work. So, if there's any topic you'd like to learn about, please let us know. Drop us an email. We're always eager to get feedback from our members. And now, for today's webinar, we're using the we're using GoToWebinar. So you can use the GoToWebinar panel on your right-hand side to change your audio settings, enter your questions, or chat with us. At the end of the webinar, we'll have a Q&A session. And just a reminder that you are on mute. If you have any questions, concerns, just feel free to chat to us in the question box. And this webinar is being recorded, so we will upload the video as well as the audio transcript. We'll provide a link to that on our website shortly. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Carla Langhorst, who is the CEO at Small Business Solver. Carla has been working with the United Church of Canada to help them launch over 300 initiatives in social innovation, including the Social Innovation Challenge, which has supported over 500 social enterprises across Canada. She's a co-founder of Small Business Solver, the leading pay-what-you-can small business resource for small businesses and social enterprises. Her personal mission is to take for-profit ideas and make them accessible to nonprofits and social enterprises to maximize their impact in their local communities. And now, Carla, what we're going to do is just switch the screen over to you. Great. So that we can get started. We're pretty excited for this one. So let's get going. And can you see it? All right. Yeah, it. perfect. Okay. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, so as you saw, thank you very much for the introduction. As uh, uh, my my background does have a lot of for profit, but also a lot of social enterprise and nonprofit uh, background. So when we talk about the growth strategies to scale up your small nonprofit, what we're going to be talking about is a lot of things that have happened in for profit, but really how do we actually learn from those? And then we're going to do a deep dive into what are the nuances. And I actually wrote a book called The Give Back Economy. And in that, I always say to people that nonprofit and social enterprise work is that much more difficult than for-profit work because there's so many more stakeholders. It's not just the customer they're going for. They don't just have a board and their shareholders. In the nonprofit world, how many people are we accountable to? And it just makes it that much more complex. So we're taking growth strategies of for-profits, but really we're going to jump into how is it so importantly different. So, let's see if I can switch my slides. Here we go. So, what to expect? So, we're going to start with why isn't this always happening? So, why don't nonprofits and charities often scale? Then we're going to talk about just in general, what is a best practice of scaling, of growing, and it's called adjacency. So we're gonna hit into that really quickly. And then we're going to cover 
I don't know, about 20 different growth strategies that are out there. So what I'm going to do is invite you at this point to make sure that you have a paper and pen. And as we go through all of these different growth strategies that are out there, just what are those nuggets? What are those ideas that you might want to explore a little bit further? which leads us into mitigating risk. So when you have a couple of those ideas as we go through them of what you'd want to explore further, well, we're actually gonna give you some of the things and the ways that you could explore some of the ideas that are resonating with you further. And then uh, an online resource that uh, will show you that you can maybe explore further, but we're then going to open up for Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, make sure you're writing those down or putting them into the chat box as we move along. Okay, so let's get started. So why don't nonprofits scale? Well, there's two major reasons, and what this one is really showing is that what works in one neighborhood doesn't work in every neighborhood. We know that. That's a big reason why we don't scale, because what's working in Ottawa might not work in Rodney, might not work in Port Alberni, and yet what's working in Victoria might not work in Saskatoon. So every single neighborhood has different challenges, different opportunities, and that's why sometimes it doesn't make sense. And so I think when we think about our own nonprofit, just being real with yourself is, is this something that just really works in this local context? Or is this something that might, we're learning things that could be shared elsewhere? Or is this model actually 100% replicable? This is something that we could scale up in that way. So just and each of those answers that you've given is the right answer. So that's fine. And, uh, and each of them, there's different nuances in this webinar that you'll be able to take away. So starting with that is, can it actually be replicated? And then the next one is risk. So we don't scale very often because the risk of not being able to deliver the social impact that we're currently doing is not something that we're willing to risk. We're already making a great change in our neighborhoods and where we are and what we're doing. We believe in it. It feels great. Um, the stories, the unexpected outcomes, all these things are amazing. And so if we were to get bigger, there's the risk that we're not going to be able to continue to serve those that we already serve. So in this, when we talk about like how to mitigate the risk, that's the really important last part. So what an adjacency is. So an adjacency is the overall strategy of growth that is a best practice. And unfortunately, I'm gonna actually share a, I'm gonna share right now a for-profit example. So for an adjacency, what, what organizations usually do is they start with their core offering. The best example here is Tim Hortons. So we're talking Canada, so Tim Hortons is the example that I think everyone knows. And so, their core offering was coffee and donuts. Well, guess what? If they had jumped, which now they actually have French fries. I don't know if you know, they have those potato wedges. They jumped all the way over there. If they had jumped to potato wedges at the beginning, who would have bought coffee and potato wedges? I, I'd like to think no one. No one would have taken that risk. It wouldn't have made any sense. And so what they did is they didn't jump right there. They ended up coming up with something that was close to coffee and donuts. They came up with bagels and muffins, and then they came up with sandwiches and grilled cheese. And then they came up with, I don't even know, I think that they ended up having some ice cream in some of the places, but these, and the ice cream one was actually almost too far away because I think in most places it didn't work. But you kept on having an adjacent product or service that was similar to what your core was and where you started in order to get to something new. So when we're looking at new ideas and growing in a direction, is that big leap going to work or is there small baby steps that we can take to get there? So we always say, whenever you're doing something, is there a way to crawl before you run? Because obviously in here, we're looking at crawling, walking, and then finally running. And in terms of change management, what's really neat about adjacencies is that we know that for every small win that you accomplish as an organization, the next thing is that much more achievable. So if you had just jumped to the first thing, it's such a pipe dream that it's actually harder to do. 
And yet with the small little baby steps, everything is possible. So here it is, guys. Here's all of the growth strategies. Wow, don't worry, we're gonna jump into these. But it's really, this is the map of how do you grow? And we can start on things that are organic. So growing from what we have internally is really what that umbrella is. And then there's things that are inorganic growth. And the inorganic growth key is that it's not just natural growth, it's that we do something dramatic in order uh, to grow quicker. And so that's really the difference, is that inorganic growth maybe goes from zero to 100 real quick. Uh, and then, of course, it would be more risky often. And then organic is things that we can do more of the baby steps. So we're going to walk through first the organic growth and each of these individual pieces. So existing stakeholders, and if this was for profit, we would have said existing customers, but this is different. New stakeholders, new channels, and then modernization we're going to dive into now. So existing stakeholders, who are these people? And remember I said at the beginning that nonprofit, social enterprise, charity, much more difficult in the for-profit world because our stakeholders are not just our customers. Uh, and here we can include, of course, our clients, our volunteers, our donors, our partners, and just the neighborhood or community at large. Um, and that's not even including with social finance emerging investors. So investors could still count in there. So really we have many more stakeholders that we need to be concerned about. I like to look at that as an opportunity. I like to think that that really means that we have more ways to grow and more strategies that we could try out. So the first major strategy under here was increase the average sale. So again, this sounds very, very for profit -y. But the average sale can mean many different things for us as nonprofits. Uh, first thing, I mean, the obvious would be the social enterprise side. Many nonprofits create the social enterprise arm, and they do, in fact, have products and services that they're selling. So it's always difficult, it's more difficult to find new customers or new stakeholders. It's always easier to grow what you already have. In the for profit world, it would be called upselling. No, we don't call it that. Um, we call it probably further engagement. And so here, instead of buying one thing at a bake sale, do they buy an entire dozen at the bake sale? On the other side is the donors. So if what's neat for each of these different uh, growth strategies that we talk about, we can look at each stakeholder again. I'm not gonna, we don't have time to do that for each of these, but you could actually think, okay, let's cross-pollinate the various stakeholders that uh, Carla just talked about, and now let's really consider this growth strategy, and let's uh, match those to each other, and it's going to help you really brainstorm. So here, if we're talking donors, could we increase the average size of a donation, of course. And so one thing that I've seen actually happen at, uh, obviously, you know, that I work with United Church of Canada, I've seen one church actually do is that in their annual meetings, they actually talked about what is the average donation from the people in the pews. And what it has done is to inspire people to say, oh, well, now I'm being educated on what an average donation is. I can slot myself of where I am. And it actually encouraged people to donate more. In fact, um, in a three-year period, they went from a deficit position to um, very positive with $60,000 surplus in a three-year time just by simply explaining um, and educating and communicating differently about what an average sale, but in this case, an average donation looks like. So the next one is not just increasing the average sale, but increase how many times people come back. Um, and so... This one, probably the best stakeholder I would uh, cross this with is volunteerism. So our volunteers. So increased frequency. Uh, how often are volunteers coming back to volunteer? For this one, my best example is a soup kitchen that actually launched on the west side of, or west Kelowna. So basically a couple of years back, Kelowna banned homelessness. And so what happened is that all the homeless uh, individuals actually crossed the bridge and went to West Kelowna. And so the agencies were in Kelowna and there weren't agencies in West Kelowna. So they really had to rally and create a food coalition and a coalition to address um, the concerns and, and the needs of these people. So relief. 
And they ended up creating uh, a ship kitchen on the fly. Uh, they ended up getting the Community Foundation was supportive of it and the Kiwanis Club. And it was really wonderful. And what happened is that they had immediately 70 regular volunteers from nothing. And the reason that they were so engaged and being there so regularly is because they built community. So in terms of increasing frequency, what are we doing to encourage volunteers to come back? Not only the ask, but also the community that we're developing. I've seen uh, many nonprofits that their whole core is, they call it the integrated community approach. And so everything is cross-pollinated so that people want to keep on coming back. Next growth strategy, and again, thinking about which stakeholder you want to choose, um, would be a new offering. So if you're already serving clients in one way, or serving volunteers or donors in one way, is there that adjacency, remember, of a new offering that we could add? So every single one of our stakeholders has multiple, multiple needs. And so as a nonprofit and charity, we might only be satisfying two, three of those needs. And yet, as we know in terms of development, especially in um, handling crisis and relief, well, next they need development and then reintegration. And so for us, in terms of a new offering, what is the next hand up that we might be able to add as an adjacency to what we're already doing? Um, an example here is the Working Center in Kitchener-Waterloo. And they started just uh, with a, a soup kitchen and handling the relief. But they kept on adding in adjacencies and new offerings that were needed by their clients. Um, and of, of course, in this case, a, a hair salon was one of the offerings that they continued to evolve into. The next one is retention. And I think that everything we just chatted about is continuing to think about our stakeholders and to really walk in their shoes is ways to see how can we continue to make sure that we maintain that and grow that relationship with them. I'm going to jump back to a for-profit example at this point in time. Uh, one of the most uh, retention-focused um, industries is financial planning. Basically, when you're a financial planner, everything in your business is about retention. Um, and so think about everything that they do in order to do that. Um, but even the best financial planners still lose five to eight percent of their clients every single year. And so there is still that need for a little bit of new but really, how do you continue to satisfy as many needs as possible, create that integrated community to help with the retention, which is always more powerful than finding new. So now that I've really plugged the message of uh, care for what you already have, I think the next part is, obviously, there is still opportunity to grow into new stakeholders. So that can be new target markets and new offerings for new stakeholders, which if we look at these, um, one is more risky than the other. So going to new stakeholders, we don't understand them as much. We don't have that dialogue. So new stakeholders in general are more risky than our existing stakeholders as a growth opportunity. Um, but at the same time, there's great opportunity there. If we were going for a new target market, so a new stakeholder with an existing service or offering that we have, that's actually less risky than going to a new stakeholder with a new offering because there's two things that we're testing. And remember with the adjacency, that would be a bigger leap. In general, for everything for new and existing stakeholders um, with social enterprise really emerging and new ways to generate income, I just wanted to offer this slide up as all different opportunities for you to be growing. So fundraising, uh, kind of a, a no-brainer that I think everyone probably is already doing. But the next one really is crowdfunding. And there's um, lots of different platforms out there that offer crowdfunding support. Uh, and this is often with crowdfunding, it's something that is going to be more innovative and unique that can really catch someone's eye. Uh, I've seen a lot of playwrights so to uh, theater groups using fund, crowdfunding to get something off the ground. Uh, there's lots of different things in there. <clears throat> grants, of course, being another one. Um, probably you're all already doing grants. Um, and then there's a few other ones to consider in here in terms of when we're looking at new and existing stakeholders of additional offerings. Um, events, of course, being a pretty standard one. Um, membership. 
being an important one. So how is there an ability to continue, especially on the retention side, to add that value and to connect with people? And is there value in that where someone would be able and willing, so willing to pay for that? Obviously programs, um, programs can have a fee behind them or programs can be pay what you can. Um, in other times we've seen that people want them to be very much open. So is there a matching sponsor that you can have with that? Or the next one being cross compensation. Obviously in the whole social enterprise world right now, people are thinking not every, I want to be able to help and serve everyone. However, we know that some people can't afford it and yet some people can afford more. And so cross compensation is the idea of how do you um, make sure that uh, everyone's able to attend and people are able to pay what they can. The challenge is of course, how you do this in a way uh, in, with dignity and making sure that everyone feels comfortable in that space still. So does it have to be at the front door? Is it just a goodwill or is it online? Like how do we make sure that this is done in a, a dignified fashion? So the first column, obviously a little bit more basic, uh, but revenue streams in terms of new offerings um, that, that are kind of new and developing is skills development. So you've probably heard a little bit about employment, social enterprise, and it's when the skills development of the clients are, uh, it's more of a developmental focus. And so although the organization might still be break even, so um, still have the nonprofit governance structure, one of the core outcomes, of course, is the skills development and the people and how th their confidence is being built through this. A great example of this one, of course, being Raw Carrot, um, which uh, basically hires individuals on ODFP. Um, it's based actually out of a Presbyterian church in Paris, Ontario. They ended up hiring individuals um, making soup. So it's really, really healthy soup. And they saw their distribution now is uh, a lot of southwestern Ontario, and they're now up to over 20 employees. Uh, they now have three locations, and it is uh, with three different faith groups that are hosting this. So this is kind of an interesting way of how can you continue to serve. Um, the rest, the next three are all intermediaries. So as a nonprofit or a charity, we have a lot of social capital. We have a lot of people with great relationships with us, uh, a lot of people who want to be part of the cause and the impact that we're making. Uh, we also have so many stakeholders. We've talked about this already. I mean, we're already speaking with so many people. So there's a few different ways to be an intermediary. Uh, a marketing or market intermediary is basically, could you actually access a market that other, um, so that people who need to access it they can use you as a venue. And probably our best example is TechSoup. <coughs> TechSoup obviously is connected with all of you. And so with some of these software companies as a market, uh, market intermediary, uh, they're adding a lot of value to the system. And so this is actually uh, a way um, to look at an income source. Another one would be a distribution intermediary. So um, are you actually a place where people can meet. A great example would be with FoodShare. FoodShare, um, they have all the locally grown food, they put them in the bags, and then they actually work with distribution intermediaries so that they don't have to deliver to every single location so that the overall cost of this fresh produce that's locally grown is lower so that it's more competitive and more people can actually access it. So there's many different locations that uh, are, are benefiting benefiting and in partnership with FoodShare. Admin intermediary, um, this is where you're actually maybe a shared platform. So a great example of this being Tides Canada, of course, where they actually do all the administration and support and governance support and liability. And uh, you could actually maybe be the back end for all the websites, um, or you could be the back end for uh, what other types of intermediary. Um, Center for Social Innovation would be another example of like the intermediary. A different one in terms of space and community development, but another type of intermediary that when you have a network and when you know people and you all have social capital, is that a new income stream for you? So relationships is an, another one that's kind of related to that, but different. 
And relationships is just who do you know that you can do the matching. Um, one thing that I've been seeing a lot of nonprofits being great at is obviously helping people get jobs. So just knowing people and being able to connect them, is there value in that? Um, I'm now speaking to a social enterprise that's being developed in Northern Ontario to match virtual assistants and people up north with uh, small business owners that need that type of support. And so really, is there a referral fee on that or is it almost um, like after six months, is that a donation that's given back based on the relationships that people already have? A sponsorship, already touched on that a little bit, but corporations, I know that as they hire more and more millennials and Z-Gen, those employees are demanding meaning making. They're demanding it. And it's no longer okay not to have uh, some sort of corporate social responsibility strategy. Um, if they don't have it, a lot of people won't stay there. And that's just a fact. Um, and then social finance. So um, any sort of investment uh, that we are giving in terms of impact, even as nonprofits and charities ourselves, is that something that we're investing in ourselves? So lots of revenue streams. I know I could probably spend an entire webinar on this part alone, um, but just all of these revenue streams are ideas that you could then uh, cross-pollinate against the stakeholders, um, against your new and or existing ones to come up with more growth strategies. So remember, I promised at least 20, so I feel like this slide alone has quite a few. So after we looked at all of our existing and new stakeholders, we move into new channels. So new channels being who are the other natural partners that we could work with. So our channel partners are one of these opportunities. Uh, the challenge in the nonprofit sector in terms of working with channel partners is that a lot of the stakeholders that we are reaching out to and communicating with and reliant on might be the same as many of our potential channel partners, especially if we're working with other nonprofits. So we might have the same donors, we might have the same volunteers, uh, so sometimes that does make this a little bit challenging. However, for nonprofits, we often have the same clients. And in that case, maybe there is a channel partner opportunity. Maybe we don't actually have to create all of the offerings um, and products and services for them. Maybe this is something that we can have partners with that we're referring clients to each other. But again, don't forget as nonprofits and charities, it's not just the clients that we're worried about. It's all of our stakeholders. That's the big thing. So maybe there's corporations, small businesses. Maybe there's other entities that could be channel partners with you. It doesn't just have to be people within the existing sector. So that is one new channel to be considering. The next one to be considering is vertical integration. Um, this basically is, again, a for-profit uh, word where we're looking at the entire supply chain. So a supply chain is where something's originally grown or manufactured until getting to the end customer. So for us, though, it would be similar. I mean, we want to deliver goods and services to the end client or the end stakeholders. And we might be only in one part of the supply chain or value chain, but we could move up or down from that. So if we wanted to move up from that, a great example, of course, being growing our own food as a soup kitchen or as a food bank. A great example of this would be the CRC in Regent Park. And not only do they have a food center there, they're one of eight in, in the country. Um, they serve thousands upon thousands of people, hundreds of programs, but they also have 190 community gardens. So they've done this vertical integration, uh, created turnkey kits for it, actively advocate for it. Uh, but even five years ago, I think they had a 90. And so they have over doubled in the last five years in terms of how many community gardens and, and actively worked on vertical integration. The next one, horizontal integration. So this is going to go back to one of those buzzwords I know that you've all heard about is the community hub. So the community hub is really the quintessential horizontal integration is they started with one 
I mean, any community hub that you look at, especially the health related ones that are often sponsored by the government at this point, um, they start with one service that's being offered. They realize exactly who their client is. They realize that the client it doesn't make sense for them having to go all over the place in order to have the complete offering that they need. So the multiple needs. And so in horizontal integration, it's just recognizing as many of the needs as possible that a client has and putting it all in this one spot or all under one organizational umbrella that you're able to deliver. So in here, maybe it is a dental office, it's physio, it's chiro, it's acupuncture, it's yoga, it's everything in one spot. Um, and that would be one approach to horizontal integration. And I need to remind you is that these new channels, again, are more risky than it would be to fully serve the existing client, uh, stakeholders in a different way. Um, but at the same time, as long as you're following the key principle of adjacencies and not overstretching yourself, this would still, in fact, be very possible for you. So the next one here is online. So again, when we're talking about channels, I'm talking about supply chain, and obviously online it is the way that people are trying to explore how they can continue to deliver in this way. So everyone, I'm sure, has social media. Everyone has a website. Um, the first question that we start asking is, do you accept donations online? Right. So that's going to be the crowd uh, funding or the fundraising way. And then from that is how else can you start to strategically use online? to getting to end stakeholders that maybe weren't available to you before. Um, lots of examples in here. I'm sure that you have your own of how you try to experiment with this. Um, some of the key principles is really trying to use <clears throat> existing online platforms that are easy for you to use uh, and just trying to make sure that it's not taking up all your time. Uh, but in terms of online, how can you actually do service or product delivery with this new method? method? So in many cases, uh, in terms of the CRC and Regent Park, they created that turnkey. They made all their information open source and available. And so not only do they have those 190 community gardens, but the online is allowing them to have advocacy work uh, with a much further reach than they would have had before. Um, one of our new ministries that's based out of uh, Northern Alberta with the United Church of Canada, uh, they actually decided not to have a church at all. And so they completely reimagined what it would be like to create a community of faith online. And so they actually come and they have all their sermons, but it's not just that. They obviously do a lot of communication support through online mechanisms. So there's lots of different opportunities when it comes to using online. I think the last example I wanted to give on the online uh, was the Stone Soup Network. Again, this was based uh, originally out of Windermere United Church, which is uh, by High Park in Toronto, uh, so the West Bloor neighborhood. And what they ended up doing is they created this entire new platform that allowed local business owners, remember us talking about stakeholders and how to involve them differently, the use online to invite uh, the local business owners to give products and services that are vouchers into this online program and then social workers and ministers and priests in the neighborhood who know the people who are not necessarily below the poverty line, but at the poverty line. And they were able to issue vouchers for dinner. They were able to issue vouchers for a haircut. And so it still had the dignity in terms of like their payment and how they're able to go to these local businesses. It actually, businesses give back. And it used this online delivery system to actually change how the neighborhood can be neighborly. The way the idea came up is basically um, one person was uh, 40 years old, had been diagnosed with cancer, they were spending all their money on uh, a, the holistic treatment, um, and when she turned 40, she wanted to go out for dinner. And so the minister went to a local restaurant owner and said, hey, like, are you willing and able to give a free meal so that she can actually celebrate her 40th with her family. And the business owner's like, of course I would want to give locally like that. Of course. Um, CFIB, so that's the Canadian Federated Independent Business Bureau, they did research showing that 99.3% of 
of independent business owners want to give back. And so it's really neat that once Stone Soup Network identified that, they were able to come up with a new way, a new channel in order to make that happen. So yes, you can tell I love that story. If you go to their website, lots of cool videos about it. So we've now talked about three out of the four in terms of organic growth strategies. So our fourth is modernization. And so this is basically taking uh, what we're already up to and just making it more streamlined and more efficient. So I'll give an example. Let's say you look at your existing value chain. So like how are you delivering your products or services to clients or stakeholders today? So imagine that uh, we have an initial contact from a client, we do the initial needs assessment with them, we onboard them in whatever way, I tried to make this as generic as possible, and then we match them with our resources, we wanna follow up to see if that was helpful and eventually get some feedback and evaluation. So hopefully this resonates with many of you in terms of the basic process map of what's already happening. So if I was trying to actually scale up my nonprofit, I start with what I'm doing today, and then I figure out what, what can't I outsource? What is actually my core competency? What's the most important thing that I have to have control of, and um, I think that is really my strength, that no one else can do as well as our organization? And so if I think about that, I think that onboarding is our thing. Um, I think that follow-up is really hard for us so we keep on dropping the ball on that and we're not always getting the evaluation that we thought that we needed but another thing that we're recognizing is that we're really good at identifying true needs so a lot of times our clients come to us and you know what they don't know what they uh, need they don't know what they don't know and so for us we're really good at identifying that we're really good at building those relationships but we're often dropping the ball on, at the back end of this process this is an example. <laughs> so what we want to do is in those places, we want to make sure that we continue to maintain what we're great at, but it gives us opportunities of where could we actually scale up or leverage strategies um, being either outsourcing, hiring new, or technology. So the times that we want to outsource is if we realize that we don't in fact need a full-time person in that, or if we know that we need someone who specializes in that area. Um, the other reason, which is being very honest here, is sometimes we just don't want to manage <laughs> one more person, or maybe this person has to have very odd shifts. So if we're trying to do 24-7, maybe um, subcontracting, outsourcing is the way to go. We do want to hire someone to scale up if the full-time is justified through pure volume of work, if there's long-term benefits and growth potential, um, and high probability of retention. We don't want to have someone in only for a couple months and realize that it's just not in our long-term budget. And of course, if the person that we're able to hire does have that upside in terms of their skill set and being able to take on more work. But with technology, and obviously with TechSoup, they have lots of great resources for us. With technology constantly evolving, maybe there's new applications that can actually help some of this process improvement. Uh, sometimes it's that consumers uh, can self-serve. So the example of the Stone Soup Network is like, how do you actually make it so that other people can use it? And um, like, does that work? Well, in our example, that doesn't really work because obviously the needs assessment and the onboarding uh, were things that it's time intensive and things that we really need ourselves. So maybe for those we continue to hire and really focus on because they're our core competencies. They're the things that really can't be outsourced. But maybe we're looking at this, the initial contact. Could that be something that is through web? I mean, obviously not everyone's gonna have access to that, but looking creatively at where can we actually scale up and remove time that might not be as strategic or as important. As a follow-up, could this actually be regular newsletters or is there a different way to do this? And then obviously the evaluation and feedback, is there another way to do that? Even the resource matching, could we use technology in here um, at all? The follow-up or the feedback, definitely on the feedback and evaluation, a lot of times it's even beneficial to outsource that. A, it's not our core competency, 
to do the impact measurement potentially. Um, and there's a lot of value of having someone else do that work for us so that we can report back objectively of what we're able to achieve. So looking at these things first, when you want to scale up and modernize what you're up to and be strategic about that scaling, you start with the process map, you realize what is not on the table, and then looking at uh, the other opportunities is like, what is possible here? Uh, primarily coming down to technology, so go back to TechSoup and see what might be a match there, um, or where does it actually in fact make sense to outsource? And is that something that you could experiment with? So now in organic growth. So we did all the organic, which is the new and existing stakeholders, the new channels, and then the modernization. That's all less risky, typically. And then here's our inorganic growth. So collaboration, um, I would say actually all of these, other than the last one, collaboration, joint ventures, merger, and acquisition, pretty much all means the same stuff. You're all like, how are you partnering with other people in order to be able to do more? And if I look at some of these examples here, um, I'll start with collaboration. One of my favorite examples is in Ottawa. It's called Center 507. Uh, and Center Point United Church uh, is where it's housed. But it's actually 27 different denominations or communities of faith in Ottawa actually have decided to all fund volunteer and support Center 507 collectively. So that type of collaboration that they were able to create um, really neat, inorganic way to do so much. And not one individual church would have been able to do that. The next one um, is a joint venture. Again, something similar ha happened in Kitchener-Waterloo. Um, it was a Lutheran a church and a united church and they merged together to create a soup kitchen that also focuses on community development so uh, mental wellness as well as community building uh, and helping with major concern of isolation and so again it was actually they set up a separate entity that they both are the boards have decided to actually be on that board as well so there's a lot of uh, shared control as well as uh, they both donate and volunteer and support that initiative so a joint venture together um merger or acquisition um what's one thing that's really neat and rural right now and i know uh, this is something that a lot of nonprofits, when we're looking at social enterprises in rural they actually don't have to come up with their own idea. Because in rural, unfortunately, there's a lot of small businesses that are currently going to market as the people who have been running it for the last 30 years are finally looking to retire. And because they're in such a small place, there's not too many buyers. And yet they might be the local cafe and there's no other opportunity there to gather. Um, it might be the local grocery store. And so imagine as a nonprofit, if this is something that we acquire, we already know the business has been working for 30 years, and especially with social enterprise emerging in the way that it is, this is a huge opportunity in rural, but where is that an opportunity somewhere else? Do we always have to create our own thing, or can we actually look for opportunities where we can actually acquire it? And then on the flip side, uh, instead of acquiring and paying the money out, it could actually be how do we actually sell things so the other way around um, so what we're seeing is a anti-bullying nonprofit in Alberta has actually designed a lot of programming and intellectual property of how to do that important work and so uh, there are actually organizations interested in buying that from them and buying the intellectual property from them so in terms of each of these the inorganic growth in terms of um, how to build out there's already examples of every single one of these models working. So few, we actually did it. <laughs> I'm sorry if I scared you with the slide at the beginning, but we actually made it through each and every single one of these. And I know, and I hope actually, that you've been taking notes the entire time and have uh, lots of different ideas that you'd now want to explore. So 
now that we want to explore things, the most important thing is, again, remembering the adjacencies. And so we don't just want to go to zero to 100 real quick. It's how do we actually figure out if something is going to work? Um, something that we've been using within the United Church of Canada is the idea of proof of concept. And again, this is a for-profit term. But um, in terms of startup culture, you want to fail fast, fail often. And which is countercultural to nonprofit. I mean, we don't want to fail. We want to keep on creating great impact. Uh, but in terms of actually growing and exploring, how do you figure out whether or not something has energy? Um, the way that we look for it is whether or not the stakeholder, the circle of stakeholders that are supporting an idea grows. So remember I mentioned we have our investors, our donors, our clients, our volunteers, our partners. Well, when you come up with a new idea, do you get new stakeholders? That's often a great way to see whether or not you have proof of concept. Another way to mitigate is to have an advisory board. I know sometimes the last thing we want is another board, but uh, we can call it something different. I know for myself, I was told the other day, I don't need an advisory board. I need a gaggle of loving aunts and uncles around me. And I thought that was a great way is that uh, it's just people to see the forest for the trees, and to say the things in hopefully a loving manner back to you of what won't work. Community engagement, of course, not just your advisory board or your gaggle. Um, it's actually reaching out further and seeing what other people think and just really being able to listen because again, we wanna fail fast, fail often, so we're not going too far down that path. And then of course, test market. So like, that is part of all these other validation tools that I just discussed on this slide. So just as a recap, um, who I am, uh, I am the co-founder of Small Business Solver. We're a pay what you can small business um, advice tool. Really cool things that you can check out if you're interested is that, uh, again, like I said, it's pay what you can. So as a nonprofit, it's free for you. Um, so please use the Go Make a Difference coupon code if you're interested. And um, you can actually do some of the business checkups. One of the really cool ones that we just launched is under business checkup, it's called um, it's a marketing solver, but you can actually search based on your time and money and your goals of your marketing. It will tell you what's the best marketing tools for you to actually be exploring. So you can actually check that out without even um, logging in. So have fun with that. Um, obviously, I, I thank you again for the great intro because uh, my mission is how do we help nonprofits and social enterprises leverage some of these great things that the for-profit industry already gets and yet fully acknowledging that our work is a lot harder because we are working with so many people. So um, what we did cover was why we don't currently and always do this. We uh, talked about adjacencies. We talked about a ton of different growth strategies out there, lots of fun. Uh, and then how do we mitigate our risk, fully knowing that that's one reason why we haven't been scaling. Um, and with that, uh, here's my contact information, and I hope there's lots of questions. All right, thank you so much, Carla. Um, so now we have some time to take the questions from the audience. So if you haven't entered your questions already, please do so now by using the questions chat box in your GoToWebinar panel. Um, so let me see if we have any questions coming in. So one question here is, I think, asking about the coupon code and where they can find it. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Uh, it's just on, um, <laughs> on the website. It's called Go Make a Difference. So if you go to a Small Business Solver under the members, Small Business Owners, you click on that, and it actually does say the coupon code on the main webpage because you definitely want to make sure that this is accessible for you. Okay. That's brilliant. Um, another thing, and maybe we can actually put that up on the blog post when we um, upload the webinar um, recording so that people can get quick access to that. Um, another question uh, is from Diego, who is asking for an example of crowdfunding. Uh, yeah, so the one that I gave was um, really the uh, theater group. Um, so when someone actually has written a script and wants to get it off the ground, typically you need that upfront funding. Um, any big event might have that, so people could 
so okay so those are the examples and so when someone actually pays for the money up front it's almost like a pre-sale right so as a theater group i want to get this new as an arts group i want to get this event off the ground so it could really be any event so i can pre-sell the tickets like way in advance so that i can actually do all of the development work <clears throat> and so it might even be a year or 18 months out um in the for-profit world a lot of people use it for like new board games or uh, new apps. There's actually gamers. So if you're developing a new game that if you uh, give money in advance, you actually can have one of the characters named after you. So there's really like, it's more of a quirky way to raise money. Um, it's trying to be almost a filler for equity raises. And yet uh, that's currently still not fully adopted within Canada. In terms of another way to do it, it, it's basically like a nuance of fundraising, but they really get something based on what level of fundraising that they've given you, is mostly how a nonprofit would be using it. So if you give $1,000, it's not that we match the $1,000, but you get a teddy bear. That's a really great way of putting it, actually. Because um, we do get asked this question quite a lot as well. Um, another question here, and this is just, a, I think it's a pretty broad question, is there are so many options for growth strategies. What should one consider when deciding which strategy to pursue? Right. Um, I'm a huge fan of weighted averages. <laughs> so what oh. that means is basically, <laughs> uh, I like to write all my opportunities down on one side. Um, and then I will actually come up so in one column, let's say. And then I will choose all the evaluation criteria of success that would work for me. Um, so it's going to depend on what your nonprofit or charity is. But what I would probably do is I would say feasibility, like chance of this actually working is one of the criteria. Um, maybe social impact, like, or reach, the number of people that I can, like, make a difference of. Um, maybe the ability to fund something. So maybe funders um, who would, if they find this attractive. So I'm just giving you three different criteria that you could use. And then I would basically rank each of my different growth ideas. Oh, actually one criteria should be riskiness, right? Of course, that was one thing that I've talked a lot about. So like, what's the risk out there? Like, am I exposing my organization to undue risk by approaching this in this way? And so if I look at all of these different things, I would then rank each of those different new growth opportunities according to that. And then I would select which way I'd want to go. Okay, that's great. Um, another question is about frequency. Um, and I think we do hear this quite a lot. Are we bombarding our donors, our supporters, uh, you know, with too many emails, uh, call to actions? So uh, this member asks, will it hurt if we send too many, say, donor letters? How do you reach the balance? Hmm, that's so funny. Um, I like it. <laughs> so um, I think I'm going to nuance that this question with donor letters or like valuable information to someone, right? So a donor love letter just asking for money versus how am I adding value to the person that I'm reaching out to? So yes, we have to ask for money. We know that if we don't ask, we do not receive. Um, at the same time, um, continuing to build your relationship with a donor could look very different. So what do they care about, right? So they care about the stories, they care about the outcomes. So I think that telling them stories, keeping you top of mind, that almost never gets old. In terms of a for-profit number I heard is if every three weeks is the optimal number of times that you wanna send out information, um, for myself, I mean, my newsletter for uh, the United Church goes out every two weeks with stories, and the one for Small Business Solver goes out once a month. So you can see, I really, I went on both sides of that three weeks with the magic number. All right. Uh, this question is about uh, adjacencies and organic growth that you had discussed. So they're saying that in their example, their organization has met strong resistance from private sector, um, you know, the private sector who fear competitive advantage. So the question is, how can they mitigate risks associated with these forms of growth and powerful private sector controls? Ooh, 
This one sounds like a fun one. <laughs> okay. Good one, though. Um, so apparently I'm a politician because I'm going to just switch the question a little bit. Is like, it, it's almost the other way around. I mean, what I'm seeing is the opposite, is that the private sector keeps on trying to come into the nonprofit sector, but in a way that isn't always genuine. And so I see that that is even a bigger risk. Um, in terms of if you are competing in terms of uh, service delivery, so let's say construction. I've actually seen uh, definitely in the U.S. as well, a lot of social enterprise construction businesses being developed. And in that case, it's still needed. You do actually have a competitive advantage because, A, you have probably more genuine relationships and you're doing it for a very important reason. But the truth of the matter is, if you're not doing the, the delivery at the same level as a for-profit organization, like you're actually not competitive. I think that was one example that Out of This World Cafe said to me. They said, our food has to be the same or better as any other cafe because they come to us the first time because they like the social impact. But they keep coming to us because we're great. Got it. Um, okay, here's a question asking, what solutions or cases can you recommend that optimize stakeholder engagement in social enterprise uh, streams versus faith-based or health crises? Okay, I might have to get you to repeat that one again or rephrase sure. it for me. <laughs> no, not at all. And there was a, there were a lot of, um, you know, in quotes there. So what solutions or cases can you recommend that, quote unquote, optimize stakeholder engagement in social enterprise streams? And I think they were positioning it as how is that different than, say, faith-based um, uh, right. or it's a health crises? Does that make sense? Um yeah, I, I'm really laughing at how much I'm changing all the questions. So I'm going to rephrase it my way is that I actually don't know if there's a difference between social enterprise and any charity, nonprofit, or faith-based anymore. Um, so my, my challenge is that I think we're all doing very, very similar work. Um, if for each of them, I would say the core thing that we're all trying to do is make meaning like meaning making. And so in terms of our stakeholder engagement, I think that's what we're all doing is genuine relationships with meaning making in the nonprofit sector. So in terms of stakeholder engagement, um, I would like to think that it would be very similar. Yeah, that, that does make sense when you come to it from that um, perspective. Um, and I think some of these questions are more maybe specific, and this one certainly is. It's asking, um, have you worked with nonprofits that want to expand their service to new territories without adding to organizational risks? And they're asking, what is the best model? Could it be social franchising? Okay. Yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, there, I could actually pull up an entire new slide. There's, so social franchising is just one model of replication. In terms of replication models, um, and actually, I don't know if I, if you would like me to send the slides, I can, but we basically, or people can reach out to me if they want to have this. Um, we've actually done an entire research project on United Church social franchising. And what we identified is that social franchising in the technical way is not going to work in every place. Sometimes what you want to do is you just want to trademark something. Sometimes you just want to license it. Sometimes you actually want to wholly own the new places and you actually don't want to franchise it. So depending on what um, level of control that you want, there's actually, see again, this could be another webinar. It's basically, there's 15 different ways of doing replication and depending on how much control you need and how much quality control you need, you would choose different ones as well as how much money you have or how much you're willing to expose yourself to risk. You would choose one of these 15 different replication models. Got it. And you mentioned trademarking, licensing, and this question sort of goes into it, asking if there's um, any suggestion for a place to start um, if we believe we might have intellectual property we could monetize. Um, okay, yes. Um, my favorite way to protect any intellectual properties is twofold, and it's because it's the cheapest. 
<laughs> any place that I can copyright, that's the best. Is just putting that C behind things. Um, in terms of uh, the other way, is basically a trade secret. So you basically want to hold it. Any other intellectual property, which is going to be like your patents or your uh, trademarks, or um, if you're trying to actually protect it legally in that way, it's a lot more difficult. Um, so copyright for trade secrets, trade secrets basically meaning that you don't share it, like Coca-Cola's recipe or KFC's. So those are kind of the two ways to first make sure that you protect it. Um, when you want to license it, you want to figure out, for me personally, is you can license it to someone who um, is qualified. So you want to make sure that you have some sort of onboarding for them, as well as that, that your values are still going to be held. Um, so I always think when I do licensing, I don't want it to be um, exhaustive. I want it to be very selective of who I'm working with. Um, the ethical dilemma of licensing <laughs> is that, yes, we want to do the licensing and we want to have that new income stream. And yet this entire open source wave that's coming is always that as a nonprofit, what that we figured out should be open source and what should actually be a revenue generator. Um, for EDGE, which is the division within the United Church of Canada, we've actually figured out um, a lot of different um, ways for renewal. So having churches reimagine what church looks like. And so we actually have created some do-it-yourself tools. And then we have a whole coaching arm where we actually do charge on the coaching side. And so how much should we have open source? How much should we charge? Um, what's the quality control on that? And that's definitely something I'm struggling with uh, right now. So it's a good question. Okay, wonderful. Well, that's unfortunately all the time we have for today. Um, but I really want to thank you, Carla, again, for coming to share your knowledge with us. We already got a few comments asking for you to come again because this was such a wonderful um, webinar. And I'd like to thank everyone else for taking time out to join us today. So just a reminder that we'll post the webinar recording to our website within a, a couple of days. And with this recording, we'll also share a link to the slide deck and audio transcript of the webinar to make it fully accessible. So please fill out the brief post webinar survey that will launch after the session and that's all for today so thank you so much and have a great rest of your day thank you thanks carla